so the cuisine of Hiakai uh, showcases um, indigenous Māori cooking techniques and ingredients. Um, so what we aim to do is highlight those ingredients and show um, that they have a lot more uses than people would think and also showcase it in a way that shows um, it has a place in fine dining um, and is relevant. Um, I decided to become a chef at a really young age. At around about eight years old, I just kind of decided and just wrote it in a book and told the teacher. And she goes, oh, do you really know what that is? And I said, yeah, yeah, you like make stuff and you eat it. It sounds really cool. Um, but I just never veered off that path. Um, so the moment I was old enough to get a job, even just washing dishes, I did. So I've been working in kitchens since I was about 14. My Samoan grandmother had a huge influence on my cooking. When I was younger, I used to help her prep a lot for Sunday lunch, um, which with Samoan families, it's a little more than just, you know, the traditional, like, five people you're cooking for. We have big families. So it was like doing mass catering. And um, because I was the slightly younger one, I got left with the bum jobs. So it was like I would be in the kitchen peeling onions and garlic and um, chopping that from a very young age. So I was very hands-on with those things. And... Um, yeah, it's still a lot of the ingredients she uses, particularly from Samoan cuisine, still like finds its way through what I do now. One of the biggest influences on my career and was actually the first chef that gave me um, a proper job in a proper kitchen uh, was a chef called Martin Bosley in New Zealand. Um, and the way I got that job was I just kind of went around the back door and kept harassing him and asking if I could work for free until eventually they let me in. And then I just stayed there until the job opening came up. And at the time, he was really ahead of his time for New Zealand and he was doing really avant-garde food and he had the best restaurant in New Zealand. So I was like, I'm going to work here for free until I can, you know, they, they can't kick me out. Um, but I learned so much from him and it really set me up really well for when I eventually decided to move to New York. Um, and I think if I hadn't worked for Martin Bosley, I probably would have gone home a lot sooner. My cooking's changed a lot over the years. So when I first started cooking, I was really focused on um, learning French techniques and molecular gastronomy, and I was just all about um, honing in and like basically trying to be the best French fine dining chef I could possibly be. Uh, as I got older, I felt like I wanted to have a better connection with the food and the diners, so um, I sort of also wanted to put some influences from my own heritage through there. So I started like mixing the techniques, which was French, Māori and Samoan, to sort of make my own new genre. And then um, the serving style became a lot more intimate. So instead of just being behind a wall or down in a basement, like I always was in New York, it was more like, I'm right there in front of you chatting with you and I might actually get you to put a few garnishes on your own plate, which people find quite, you know, they're like, oh, okay. And, Let's just have a conversation, you know. The dining scene in New Zealand has changed a lot, particularly over the past five years, and it's a lot to do with social media. Um, when I first started in cooking, you know, if we wanted to know what were like the hottest trends at the French Laundry or um, what was going on at like Gordon Ramsay's restaurant in the UK, we had to wait for the book to come out. And by the time it got to us, the book was like two years old. <laughs> so with social media, now we know what, you know, Renee Renzepi did yesterday. We know what Dominique Crane is going to do next week because she's just announced something. So it's sped up that gap um, between like New Zealand being, I guess, behind um, now we've been able to close that gap and now we're actually seeing like a lot of exciting things happening and a lot of chefs also who spent a lot of time working in like restaurants on the San Pellegrino World 50 Best and like three, two, one Michelin star restaurants have come home and it's like we've all come home at the same time. So it's probably the most exciting time it's been to be a chef in New Zealand in a really, really long time. What keeps me going is it's almost the day to day. So it's like, you know, each day you learn something new you also get something wrong. So it's almost like every single day I'm trying to improve upon the day before and it just keeps rolling on year after year after year. It's like I feel like I've never really, I'm always just striving for perfection and I know I'll probably never reach it, but it's just like that is just constantly what keeps me going. It's like, oh, yesterday I made these five mistakes, so I want to try and not do them today. Okay, well, today I learned this and I realised I don't know that much about this. Okay, well, can we try and learn that too? Um, so it just never ends.
Hikai started out as a pop-up dining series um, that I started two years ago. Basically, I moved back to New Zealand and I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay. So I thought, oh, well, I'll do some pop-ups while I'm there and just see how it goes. What I didn't expect was it to turn into basically a national movement and kind of changing the whole culinary scene in New Zealand. Um, so what started as a pop-up is now like transformed into um, a restaurant uh, which just has 30 seats. Um, a consulting company and branching out into books and television and there's just so many directions that Hikai has gone into it's just kind of exploded it's kind of it's been a really crazy ride so Hikai um, translates to hungry and Maori so when I set up Hikai um, well before I'd called it Hikai I wanted a name that um, well was Maori but also described myself and what I was trying to do with the movement. Um, so when I came across the word hikai, meaning hungry, I was like, that's perfect. Because I'm hungry to learn, people are hungry, we're feeding hungry people, this is like, and it just, just clicked and I wrote it down, I was like, that's the name of the company. I guess a lot of people have always wondered why there's no Māori restaurants and I thought in my own arrogance that the reason there was no Māori restaurants was that nobody was particularly good at cooking and that I was just going to swoop in and um, with all my Michelin star training I could transform it overnight. Um, what I realised was that um, it, the problem was is there's actually no supply chain. So in order to create that restaurant you have to go and create a supply chain before you can even actually create a bricks and mortar. Um, so the biggest thing I've learned is the challenges that faces Māori cuisine and like how to fix it and like how to actually grow these things because I'm having to work with um, different producers to figure out a way to commercialise a lot of products in order for the industry to actually grow. Um, some of the unique indigenous um, products I work with, well there's two seasonings I use the most. One is kawa kawa which is like a bush basil um, which is probably the most important in the Māori pantry. It's um, slightly peppery, um, a little bit fresh, a little bit like arugula um, and it also has a lot of medicinal properties so whenever you have a cold you would make tea out of the leaves and that would take away all of that. And you can also make a balm, so if you had eczema, you would rub it on your skin. Um, another one is hotapito, which is also a pepper. Um, it's really spicy, and I use that in place of um, black pepper. So I don't actually use black pepper anymore in my cuisine. I've completely replaced it uh, with like different forms of um, hotapito. And another one, which is probably my favorite, is uh, titi bird. Uh, which can be found at the very, very, very bottom of New Zealand. And only one Māori tribe is allowed to harvest those birds, so I'm not even allowed to harvest them. I have to deal with their chiefs and ask them very politely. On the one month they go each year if they will catch them for me. Um, and that bird, it, it's like duck and it has a lot of fat, but it also um, has a slight anchovy taste and aroma. And a lot of people, when they smell it, they're like, oh, I'm not so sure about this. But then when they eat it, they're like, that's incredible. And I've never come across another animal that can come close to replicating that flavour. I think what I've learned over the years, I used to be quite um, an angry little chef and used to shut down people's ideas all the time and be really, really um, grumpy. And I think I've changed a lot because I started to realise that, well, one, I want people to stay a long time, and two, um, I didn't enjoy that when I was coming up through the kitchen ranks, so why would I do that to people who are starting out? Um, so like I set aside a day where everybody actually gets to put forth their ideas and no idea is a bad idea because sometimes it's just people's backgrounds are different and they've seen something you haven't and that might be the key to making that dish awesome. So that's where I think I've grown up as a chef is just like actually being open to other people's ideas and realizing that I'm not amazing, I don't know everything, and that sometimes the intern might be able to make my job that much easier. I guess to keep um, staff interested and like you know keep them alert and learning, um, I do like to go out and forage and find weird things that they might have not seen before, just to expose them to something different and keep them you know fascinated because it can. We, you know, you can get boring day to day when you're dealing with the same thing. So I like just like throw out some weird ones in there. Um, and also get them working on individual projects as well, um, whether it's to do with fermentation or wanting to like change the way you do a butter or just looking at a different technique for cooking some of the meat. I mean, I tried to set aside 
at least a few hours a week to go and visit family and it sounds really corny but um, that's become a lot more important to me as I've gotten older. I know when in my 20s I was in New York and like did not care and was like I'm living my life but um, now that I'm in New Zealand I do like to spend some time with them and also um, I always find spending time with my nieces and nephews actually relaxes me a lot and sometimes I'll bring them to film shoots so that if I start getting grumpy throughout the day I'll just pick one up and cuddle them <laughs> and put them back and it's weird like what it does to me everyone's just like whoa that was like magic it's just like she cuddled a baby and now she's fine <laughs> it works though I never thought not that I'm like clucky or anything right now but it helps <laughs> um if our back of house was a song it would probably be some kind of hip-hop um we kind of keep it gangster and don't take ourselves too seriously and just kind of like mm, yeah because I feel like that's how I cook too instead of just being like classical music like Ruff, what's here? I'm like no I'm feeling it I'm feeling it you know trying to keep the energy levels up too you're gonna be on your feet all day yeah. <laughs>